Okay, so first of all, I did have people who were concerned. After that last video, I got messages concerning the vinyl art. It's the best of Scott Joplin. In fact, uh, Max Marath plays the best of Scott Joplin. So I figured with Black History Month, why not the king of ragtime? I love Scott Joplin. So um, I can understand the concern though, because for some reason, I don't know why this happens, but when I'm editing, the final product always ends up like matted or like somewhat blurry. So I don't know, but I will put in the description box the name of that. So you can actually look at what the uh, artwork looks like. So yeah, and, um, but anyway, with that said, <laughs> <laughs> this is a video that I actually wanted to do last year because last year is 100 years since the event. <laughs> and um, I, I actually did a video on this and I was watching the video and I'm like, I need to redo this. <laughs> so, um, It's going to be long, <laughs> a lot longer than the last one. The last one I deleted, got rid of it. And um, yeah, there was a lot of misinformation. And uh, when I watched it, it was like, I'm, I'm, man, I'm really taking a side here. And no, nah, <laughs> nah. So, so here we go. The event is the Roscoe Arbuckle scandal that happened in 1921. Now I'm going to start, I'm, I'm going to talk about Roscoe and then I'm going to talk about Virginia Rapp and then go into the scandal. So um, I'm also going to talk about how through the years there's been a lot of misinformation <laughs> that comes, because that's what happens. There's like all these theories and, and everything like that. I've fallen for them. Look, I have been following this particular uh, case since I was in high school. I've been following it as much as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. I think these are like the two big events of the 20s. So <laughs> and um, so anyway, let's go ahead and start with Roscoe Arbuckle. Now, he had a terrible childhood. His dad, okay. He was born in 1887 in Kansas. Now his parents were of thinner build. Roscoe was a 13 pound baby. So he, he was big when he was born. And his dad, William Arbuckle, decided that Roscoe was from an illegitimate, he was, that basically Roscoe was illegitimate, that his wife cheated on him, and named Roscoe after a crooked politician that was known for being a philanderer. So Roscoe Conkling of New York was a, well, was a senator in New York. And um, just, oh my gosh. Um, Roscoe's birth was traumatic for his mother. There was a lot of health problems that resulted. And um, so she died when he was 11. Now, when he was two, they moved from Kansas to California. And his first taste of uh, being an entertainer, he was eight years old. And what's uh, the Frank Bacon Company in, uh, he 
it doesn't say what he did, like if he was like singing or dancing or anything like that. But yeah, he had he, he did a performance and he loved it. Absolutely loved it. And he continued his performances until his mom died in, in 1898. He was 11. And uh, that's when his dad basically decided he wasn't going to support this child anymore. The more I read about Roscoe's dad, I got so angry. <laughs> it's like he just had it in his head that his wife cheated. Never once thinking that this child could have some kind of health issue or something. I don't know. But even in, in the 1920s, that could have been a possibility. No, he just wanted to be an asshole. <laughs> I was just, well, this gave Roscoe the opportunity to work in a hotel. And this is what I love is that he, when he would work, he did odd jobs around the hotel. And when he would walk around the halls of the hotel, he would sing, he would dance, he would, you know, and, uh, and it caught the attention of this uh, professional performer. And he told Roscoe to go to a talent show where he would be judged by the audience and the uh and by these judges much like you know what simon Cowell does now and uh what is it the x factor <laughs> or america's got talent or something like that so it was along those lines as well yeah they had those back then too <laughs> well here's the thing is he was he was singing, he was dancing, he tried to do some little goofy things, you know, clowning around, that kind of stuff. And the audience just was not impressed. Now, I'm sure you've seen in the cartoons, like the Bugs Bunny cartoons, where it has, you know, the shepherd's crook that comes out to pull you off stage. He saw that coming towards him and he panicked and he just, he fell into, like he, uh, like, flipped into the orchestra pit that was his first reaction of what to do and the audience loved it absolutely loved it and he won that competition <laughs> because of that that also began his vaudeville career and so in 1904 he started uh, working in vaudeville with several different groups. Uh, there was like a all over the West Coast, like in California. There was also one at the Orpheum Theater in Portland. I didn't know he was in Portland. <laughs> That's just south of where I live. And he started with a vaudeville troupe that uh, he was the main act and they went on tour. Now in 1908, he married a woman by the name of Minta Durfee. He and Minta uh, can be seen in a few Max Sennett movies. <laughs> in fact, I think she's in uh, Fatty Joins the Force, that cop movie. <laughs> uh, yeah, started many early comedy films, often with Arbuckle. Um, so they continued to tour together. And then in 1909, he began his film career. He first appeared in Ben's Kid. Then uh, he, uh, 1913, he moved to Universal Pictures. And then worked with Max Sennett in the Keystone Cop comedies. 
Now, he was very self-conscious about his weight, but was willing to use it for comedic purposes, but on several conditions. <laughs> He didn't want to use it for a cheap laugh, such as getting stuck in a doorway, getting stuck in a chair, and that sort of thing. And I don't blame him. I don't blame, it, blame him at all. And, you know, when I read that, I started watching some of the films that, he's, that still survive with him in it, in them, and you don't see that. So, um, I, you know, I wish that Hollywood still respected people that way. I said it. <laughs> and um, now people would praise his singing. Now I've found recordings of Rudolph Valentino singing and Lily Elsie singing. There was also a recording of um, Edwin Booth, he's not singing, he's just reciting Shakespeare. It's, it's very grainy and not very good, but at least we have it. <laughs> I tried to find a recording, so I don't know if it exists anywhere. Um, if you're able to find it, please direct me to it. I would love to hear him sing. Now, it says that his physical size, despite his physical size, Arbuckle was remarkably agile and acrobatic. And when you watch those films, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I've said before that I was a large uh, individual while dancing. And I, I was self-conscious about my size and, and everything. But at the same time, you know, looking back, I, I was dancing. <laughs> and, um, and everything. But after I quit dancing, there were those troops that would show up of larger women ballet dancing. And I was like, yeah, it doesn't matter what size you are, you can still do these things. <laughs> so, um, And you know, Max Sennett even says he skips up the stairs as lightly as Fred Astaire. So, I mean, <laughs> that's quite a compliment <laughs> to be compared to Fred Astaire. Uh, Arbuckle was fond of the pie in the face gag. And uh, it says that the earliest known pie thrown in film was the 1913 Keystone one reeler, A Noise from the Deep. I don't know if that's a lost film. And Arbuckle was in it. And uh, he, so here he is, he's rising up uh, in Hollywood. He's making good money. He ended up with a uh, studio with Buster Keaton. He and Buster Keaton became really good friends. In fact, he became friends with, he was friends with Harry Houdini. There's pictures of him with Harry Houdini. And he was friends with uh, like Mary Pickford and, and uh, Douglas Fairbanks and just and, and Charlie Chaplin. He and Charlie Chaplin were really good friends and just so, but he, he and Buster, as I was saying, had a studio named Comique. And it's C O M I Q U E, <laughs> so it's a, it's a play on comic. And um, but Buster, after a while, stepped away from it. He, you know, Buster's always doing his own thing. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, two friends with the studio, and uh, or I think it was anyway. Um, and, and they were putting out films for a while and 
So there was that. And he did have some health problems for a while. There was an infection on his leg. And I guess he, he did go through a short time where he went, he was like addicted to, I think, morphine, but he was able to kick it. And um, yeah, it didn't last very long. And um, yeah, because there was like a, when that happened, there was like a, a scare, like he was going to lose his leg and, <laughs> and everything. Yeah, that's, that's a little scary. And um, but fortunately, because he was about to go on tour. If, uh, yeah, it seems like he was going to go on tour. But fortunately, everything blew over and he went on tour. <laughs> and um now he absolutely hated the name fatty and i was reading some of the the names that people called him like the prince of wales like the animal w-h-a-l-e-s and that sort of thing i mean this is a guy that he <laughs> He's so self-conscious about his weight and to have a nickname like fatty it had followed him since he was in school and then you become this successful person in hollywood you have to think that hollywood is brand new back then and you're making it in motion pictures <laughs> and they're calling you fatty <laughs> and and everything now the one thing that it's saying here is fatty is the character that arbuckle plays well you know i i kind of understand that you know being on youtube and of course bunhead being my nickname and everything and there's a lot of other people who you know they talk about the the persona that somebody plays you know it's just a character that excuse only goes so far your fans can only use that excuse so far you know, if I were trying to hide behind, if I did something stupid and tried to say, well, you know, Bunhead did it, I think you guys would riot. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's justified because <laughs> I should know better. But, um, I mean, and, and, but it's not Arbuckle. It was not Roscoe. You know, and it also says that when he was portrayed as a female, the character was named Miss Fatty. He was constantly trying to discourage people from calling him Fatty and would actually say, I've got a name, you know. And uh, so. <laughs> and, and I, you know. I understand where he's coming from, but at the same time, I, I, I don't know, it goes both ways. Like here, he's actually discouraging people from trying to use the persona. <laughs> I see on YouTube all the time where people are wanting to hide behind the persona all the time. It's like, <laughs> I did something stupid, persona on. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> it's just a nickname. Yeah, Bunhead is just a nickname. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I that was the thing is I remember watching a TV movie back in the 90s. Uh, ABC was doing a bunch of those uh, TV movies about the uh, movie duos like Three Stooges and they did one on Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis and, and all that. Well, the one with the Three Stooges, I remember a scene in particular where it showed one of the fans coming up and, you know, like she poked one of the guys in the eye and was hitting him and all of this stuff. It, it, you know, she's laughing about it and, and all that. But I guess that one of the guys actually dealt with that at, to the point where he just didn't, he hated the fans. It's like, <laughs> you need to detach. <laughs> It's, it's for your entertainment. They don't do that out away from the screen. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. I don't remember which one that was. I think it was a Curly. The guy who was Curly. And and I just remember that particular scene in particular, just that scene. And <laughs> well, it's the same thing here, you know, not wanting to call him by his real name. You know, it's like the Jim Croce song. I got a name. <laughs> I love Jim Croce. So that is Roscoe. Now let's take a look at Virginia Rap. Maybe. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> the site stalled for a second. <laughs> okay, so Virginia was born in Chicago in, on July 7th, 1895. And her mother died when she was 11 years old, which <laughs> I just thought of that. Uh, Roscoe's mom. Okay, <laughs> that, that's a little creepy. <laughs> Her mom dies when she's 11, and his mom died. Okay, <laughs> that's a little spooky. <laughs> her grandmother raised her. And at 14, she began working as a as as a model. Now it says commercial and art model. Um, I'm going to address this, and uh, because I have read so many different things about Virginia, and I'm going to debunk it now because the recent things that I you know I've read a lot of things over the years and. The recent things that I've read basically just destroys all of it. Um, I fully understand that Virginia was a party girl. In fact, there were enough of her friends that said, oh yeah, she was. She was a full-blown party girl. She loved a party. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of people in the 20s that did. You know, that was something that my great-grandmother talked about. My great-grandmother was a flapper. And one thing that she said was, any time that we could get raw alcohol, we took it. She said, you know, to be told that we couldn't have that, we didn't do anything. Why are we being deprived of this thing? It, good point. <laughs> you know, when she put it that way, it made me think, you know, why are you taking away something? Yeah, it, it it was kind of a stupid thing when you when you go with that. Um. So no wonder they did the whole speakeasy just so. <laughs> oh, so, and and my great grandmother was a party girl too. <laughs> And she didn't hide it either. She enjoyed telling us. <laughs> oh, good heavens. So, but the point that I'm trying to make here with, with Virginia is that for years now, again, I've been following this scandal since I was in high school. I graduated in 2000. Um, I have heard constant stories about how uh, she was like 16 and that was her first abortion. Now, I'm, I don't judge people. I, I don't, you know, <laughs> I, I really don't. If she did, okay. But there have been theories that go around to high heaven that she had an abortion right before the night in question. And I'm going to tell you right now that proof has come out that she did not. <laughs> okay. So it, it, it's a total William Randolph Hearstism. Okay. People are believing his yellow journalism and you need to stop. Okay. Some of the things that he said during this 
is disgusting. Like I was reading some of the uh, the articles and everything. I'm like, there are pornos that are <laughs> that aren't this bad. What is wrong with you? Oh, and that was in 1921. <laughs> oh. I understand that sex sells, but that's, that's over the top. So um, I do know that she at one point had a child and put it up for adoption. And um, because she was busy with her movie career, she had, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the point is, is that she, she did have a child and put it up for adoption. And this was during, uh, she had found herself in a film career. But, you know, there was this whole idea that she had abortion after abortion after abortion. That's not true, <laughs> okay? N no. No, it's been debunked several times over, and we need we need to stop with that. Okay, we absolutely need to stop. So, I wanted to address that before going any further talking about Virginia Rap. So, with that said, yes, she's a party girl. <laughs> it's the twenties; they did not have. As my grandmother, as my great grandmother said, they were deprived of something and anytime they could get it, they went for it. I can't even imagine. I mean, <laughs> so anyway, with that said, in 1916, Virginia uh, relocated to San Francisco. She was going to continue her modeling career. Now, to kind of elaborate on what an artist model is because it says commercial and artist model basically i'm sure that a lot of people know what that is already but just <laughs> indulge me on this okay so an artist model is basically you pose for a model i mean you you pose for a, a painter because you know at that time they they didn't have <laughs> Radio was in its infancy at that time, and they didn't have TV, so that a lot of people were painting at that time. And so, to be an artist model, that was you could make a lot of money, you know, even just posing in a field of flowers. You know, it, it doesn't always mean that you were a nude model, so um. I, I hate that everyone immediately thinks sexual. No, no, no. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, when she came to San Francisco, she met a dress designer named Robert Moskowitz, which I love that name, <laughs> in an American tale, there's, their last name is Mouskovitz, which at the very beginning of the movie, uh, you see the the name of the family that they're living with, you know, that the, their little mouse hole is, and it's Moskovitz, and then they're Mouskovitz. <laughs> so just a little, I've watched too many movies, it's ridiculous. So she's engaged to Robert, but unfortunately, not long after the engagement, he is killed in a streetcar accident. And she then moves to Los Angeles. And in 1917, this is when her career's change her career changes 
Um, she meets a director by the name of uh, Fred Bell Schoffer. <laughs> I hope I'm saying that correctly. And she receives a role in Paradise Garden and is opposite of Harold Lockwood. And uh, again, another movie reference, <laughs> Singing in the Rain, Donald Lockwood, which I'm wondering, give me a second here. Uh, now, I'm wondering if they decided to use that name for the movie because of him. I wouldn't be surprised. So she was hired again by Belshoffer for the movie Over the Rhine. Now this film has two really big names. There's Julian Eltinch, who was a female impersonator. He was extremely successful. If you ever get a chance, look him up. <laughs> I restored and colorized a picture of Julian Eltinch, and when I read about him, I I was amazed at his success. And this film also has Rudolph Valentino. So um, it, now, over the Rhine, uh, I guess in the magazines, you know, like in the film magazines, like I guess Photoplay or, you know, what have you, they called her the best dressed girl in pictures. And uh, then there was another film that wasn't released until after her death that was called The Isle of Love. Uh, in 1919, she started a relationship with a director producer named Henry Lerman. Now, they were engaged and lived together. But in the census of 1920, she's listed as a boarder in his home, which I'm guessing would mean that she had to pay rent there. Or I, it's it's very confusing. When I read that, I I was, <laughs> I'm guessing they did. The, okay, I guess it's because, of course, at that time, it was taboo. <laughs> <laughs> to have a couple who is not married living together. So that's why they did that. Um, <laughs> now it makes more sense. Now she appeared in several of his films. However, almost, there are many of his films that are lost, so we don't know how many. But four in particular are his music sneeze, a twilight baby, a punch of the Irish, and a game lady. So, yeah, one thing that is so heartbreaking, it breaks my heart whenever I hear that a film is lost. But I mean, I understand the circumstances, especially, you know, like with World War I and, and the materials, because there were a lot of, yeah, they melted down materials, especially like with the, because of what the uh, films were made out of the uh and and everything and they needed to use it for whatever but the uh what i'm going with this is um there were so many people coming to hollywood to start a career as a movie star and 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 we'll never see their movies <laughs> And and that that breaks my heart because I I would love to see well even some of the movies like uh well just just in general so um yeah see and and even here it says uh following Rap's death rumors arose supposedly to besmirch her character that she had given birth in Chicago in 1918 that would be the so it, it was a rumor. <laughs> Uh, in 1918 and put the baby in foster care. Okay, so that one was a rumor. Uh, these rumors were proven false by the autopsy. Okay, 
So, so that's another one that's debunked. Um, I thought that it wasn't, but it turns out it is. So you're seeing right here that, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, all these other ones that are, yeah, like I said, William Randolph Hearst had a field day with this. In fact, he said at one time that he sold more papers with this scandal than when the Lusitania sank. I mean, I can't even imagine, because uh, Pulitzer died in 1911. I can't even imagine if he were still alive and and that feud was still going. You know, the, the whole competition of selling more papers and everything, you know, trying to outdo each other. I mean, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> it's bad enough that in court, they try to destroy someone's reputation, you know, and that that's still going. Every time I watch a, a, a court, you know, like a, a, a case thing on, and uh, there's always the need to, to smear the victim. Well, <laughs> times never change. It should, but it doesn't. But anyway, so, Yeah. So all that. <laughs> Just debunked people. Don't 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 do that. Okay. So now we're gonna talk about the scandal. Now it happened on September fifth, nineteen twenty one. Okay, it was, it was a Labor Day. Now, I do have to say that um, I'm not quite sure if it was just like a, a Labor Day party that Roscoe put together or if it's, you know, they, they finished filming and he decided to to set up this party. I I wasn't able to find that out, and um, I I've never been able to actually pinpoint what it was. I, I mean, even here it says he took a break from film schedule, despite burns from an onset accident. So they went to the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco, uh, he and, and a couple of friends. And they went into what was known as the party room. And of course, one thing to understand is that there was, he ordered actual case, you know, cases of real alcohol not bootleg but real um so there was i mean virginia rap was there and she was found seriously ill in one of the rooms now One of the, this is another one of those mysteries that I have never been able to figure out <laughs> because, um, you know, like back in high school, the idea was that she was, and, and it continued to linger like uh, back in the 2000, like mid 2000s when I would watch some of the uh, documentaries on this case and they talked about how she was found in a bathroom like uh the sweet bathroom or whatever and roscoe found her 
and and of course she's ill she she told him that she was not feeling well you know she's hunched over the toilet or the the bathtub or whatever and then he carries her you know carefully picks her up and carries her into you know lays her on the bed and then he goes out into the hallway and asks a female uh, party guest to be with her while he goes and finds the hotel doctor. Once the doctor is with her, he calls an ambulance. There's also another story where just as he lays her down, a couple of party guests come in because people were trying to find Roscoe. And that's when somebody uh, goes to look for the doctor, the hotel doctor. So it's like somewhere in there is the truth because of course here it says she was found by the hotel she was found and examined by the hotel doctor who concluded her symptoms were mostly caused by intoxication and gave her morphine she was not hospital she wasn't taken to the hospital until two days after the incident i just um So, <sighs> see, the reason I pause is because I, I always heard it that she was taken that night to the hospital. That's a dumb doctor, to be honest. If he's just like, oh yeah, it's it's because you you've been drinking. <laughs> oh my gosh. Now again. Okay, I really don't like this person. <laughs> when they finally take her to the hospital, there's this woman named Bambina Maud Delmont, and she will not shut up. I can't. And she immediately claims that Roscoe sexually assaulted Virginia. Well, the doctors did an examination and found no evidence of that. Now, she died the next day. Virginia passed away the next day. And I mean, she had infections. She had what's called a uh, peritonitis. And uh, which is like, let me see if I can, it's inflammation which is um, on the lining of the inner wall of the abdomen. She also, which that was caused by a ruptured bladder. I mean, this poor girl was sick. I should say a young lady, she was in her 20s. So yeah, Vir Virginia Rapp was very sick. She's a very sick young lady, and I mean, and the liquor didn't help. The, the liquor did not help at all. Now, her friends did say that she, she loved to party. And uh, when she would drink, she had a habit of tearing at her clothing, 
and it says, uh, and then, okay, it says, tearing at her clothing from the resulting physical pain. So, so yeah, it would look like somebody tried to do something to her, but, um, but when her friends are saying, nah, she does this all the time. To be quite honest, she should have stopped drinking, but I'm not her parent. It's, it's just sad, you know? And um, when the party happened, it, it says that her reproductive health was a greater concern because of the, it was urinary tract infections that were, the autopsy revealed Virginia Rapp never had any abortion and was, a, she was never pregnant. So, um, yeah, I, I could have sworn I read recently that she, she had a baby and put it up for adoption, but that was still, um, that was not a thing, but yeah, uh, Hearst did quite a number, but he's not the only one. This, this bitch did too. <laughs> I mean, she just, she, okay. <laughs> Well, you're gonna you're gonna hear her name a lot. Yeah, Delmont just pisses me off. She she immediately she then went to the police because she wasn't getting her way with the doctors and told them the same thing that that Arbuckle did this thing to Virginia. And I mean, the police, you know, being the medical experts that they are said that his overweight body lying on top of Virginia caused her bladder to rupture. Her manager immediately accused Arbuckle. I okay. I I cannot believe how fast this escalated. So her manager accused Arbuckle of using a piece of ice to simulate that act with Virginia that's leading to her injuries. You know, this is this is the thing is that one thing to understand is he didn't know her. Okay, and, and I understand that with he had no clue who she was. The only reason she was there was for a <laughs> yeah, and 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 everything. I mean, it just this escalated so damn fast because of this bitch. <laughs> and you know, really, my, my mother has said it before, the only two people that really know what happened that night are Roscoe and Virginia. But I mean, this is so ridiculous. The police are not medical experts. And, and I think it's disgusting the fact that they immediately decide, hey, this random woman came in here. Yeah, let, let's totally go with that. And I, I know that some people are going to say, you don't have to know your victim to, to do that kind of an act. I understand that. I, I've, I've been sexually assaulted and I, I, I fully get that. I just, it's, it's just really irritating to be falsely accused of it 
and 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 that's where I'm coming from. I'm just I'm I'm irritated, and and it's been a hundred years now. It's just really. And uh, yeah, and then Hearst did his thing, said that instead of ice, it was a, a bottle. It just, I, you know, I can't even imagine. It doesn't say how quickly it escalated, but it, it, Arbuckle denied any wrongdoing. I mean, like I said, there there were stories that said, you know, claims that all he did was he moved her into, you know, to lay her down on the bed and then go and get uh, women who were uh, guests, women guests, to stay with Virginia while he went and got the hotel doctor, which. I think the hotel doctor was worthless if he didn't even take her to the hospital. Um, and and Delmont just continued. He she incriminated Arbuckle, said uh, incriminating Arbuckle to the police in an attempt to extort money from Arbuckle's attorneys. She just wouldn't shut the fuck up. And. Trust me, it gets worse with this cow. <laughs> I just I usually don't call people that name. But she just takes the cake, man. She just she used let, let me tell you something. She used this. She instigated a scandal to get famous. But she she gets she gets it in the ass eventually, but right now I'm I'm just so, um, of course, yellow journalism came in. Uh, he was uh, seen as a creeper, thanks to William Randolph Hearst, you know, a, a lecher who uses his over his his weight to overpower innocent crime. Right. Let me tell you. Let me tell you something about William Randolph Hearst. Okay, you know the whole thing about hating. Uh, Bruce Ismay, okay, he and uh, Bruce and William Randolph Hearst were having a fight before Bruce went over so that he could board Titanic. William Randolph Hearst couldn't let that go, okay, he's that much of a child. When Titanic sunk and he found out that Bruce Ismay survived he demonized the living shit out of this guy right okay well here's the thing is there were so many other aristocrats that survived and once they found out that hearst was attacking bruce ismay they're like oh yeah he's he's a jerk for getting into a lifeboat and it's like dude shut up you did too <laughs> In fact, there was a lifeboat full of aristocrats that didn't even try to go over to the wreckage to save people. And there were other newspapers that called that out. Hearst didn't. <laughs> he was too busy just piling it on top of Bruce Ismay. So honestly, <laughs> please. He's such a man child. I can't stand it. He did this simply because he had a fight with Bruce Ismay. And, and then he just decided that he had won at that point. He destroyed somebody using his newspaper. And I think that's sick. And I would just like to point out that Bruce Ismay helped a lot of people into lifeboats before he got into one. Honestly. So yeah, it says here, it sold more newspapers than an event since the sinking of the Lusitania. 
and, and he used like all those exaggerated stories. Oh, geez. I can't, I mean, like I said, I, I was reading some of those because I was curious to see exactly what he said. They're awful. Just terrible. Uh, morality groups called for Arbuckle to be sentenced to death. Thanks to, uh, is just, but, but this is how, and, and you know what? Nothing has changed because there are people who just decide something with no evidence. I've seen it all over YouTube. I mean, I've even seen James Charles where he says, well, I have the receipts, but I don't feel like showing them. And his fans are like, I believe you. So, I mean, nothing has changed. <laughs> nothing has changed at all. I mean, you have Hearst just saying whatever he wants to destroy a man's career simply because Delmont decided that he did terrible things to Virginia, which... <laughs> We'll get to her in a minute. I can't wait to get to that part. That has not changed at all. <laughs> oh my gosh. Now, there is a silver lining here and, and uh, because it says he was regarded by those who knew him closely as a shy man, a good natured man who was shy around women. And, uh, but, you know, they tried to defend him. They did everything they could to, to defend his honor and, and try to debunk everything that, you know, <laughs> And uh, the studio, Hollywood, folded. Uh, they even threatened Arbuckle's friends, <laughs> saying not to publicly speak up for him. And uh, Buster Keaton didn't <laughs> give two shits about it. In fact, he made a, a movie called it's titled cops and it's all about this i mean how political i think that's the most political he's ever gotten <laughs> correct me if i'm wrong and uh, but yeah uh charlie chaplin spoke up and uh But Buster, when he spoke up, yeah, he, he did, uh, he only got a mild reprimand. So it was like they, the, the studios told them, you, you better not do this, and they did it anyway. It's like, <laughs> William S. Hart. Now, if you remember William S. Hart, I called him the, the John Wayne of the silent film industry. Um, he never worked with Arbuckle, never met him or anything. He um, he spoke out against Arbuckle, said that he was guilty and everything. And uh, Arbuckle <laughs> later wrote a premise for a film portraying Hart as a thief, bully, and wife beater, which Keaton purchased from him. The result film, The Frozen North, was released in 1922. So, so I was wrong. He, he did a few <laughs> political. Oh. <laughs> oh, good heavens. Yeah, serious. I mean. <laughs> oh, I, I love the friendship of Roscoe and Buster. And, and you know, Everyone needs a friend like Buster Keaton, who always has your back and will do anything for you. 
and, and doesn't care. Who, who could seriously care less if he's going to get shot down? This proves it. I mean, <laughs> he could care less if William S. Hart is, because William S. Hart was a veteran actor. And he really didn't care. <laughs> and it says here, uh, Hart refused to speak to Keaton for many years. Oh, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, if you've never, that's that's another part that I don't understand is when you've never talked to a person, when you've never worked with a person, why would you lash out like that? So honestly, Hart deserved it. <laughs> He's an amazing actor because I've, I've seen a few of his movies. Amazing actor. But serious, if you've never worked with Roscoe, have never interacted with Roscoe, shut up. <laughs> okay, so at the trial, the prosecuting attorney is a dickhead. <laughs> Matthew Brady. Now I understand that he's ambitious and that's great. I mean, if he's got that Perry Mason mentality, good. However, he tainted this thing like nobody's business. He decided that he was going to make Roscoe Arbuckle fry. And he pressured witnesses he, uh, to make false statements. He uh, brought in other witnesses that were never there. Uh, he tainted um, evidence. He would also make sure that certain evidence was never brought in. I mean, he, it was it was a mess. It was an absolute mess. He was doing everything in his power to make sure that uh, Roscoe was put away and would receive death like the, the people wanted. And uh, so, in fact, uh, he first, his first star witness was Delmont. <laughs> okay, this is, this is the amazing part. So the defense, received a letter from Delmont admitting to plan to extort payment from Arbuckle. Uh, now, she constantly changed stories and her testimony would have ended any chance of going to trial. Ultimately, the judge found no evidence of sexual assault. After hearing testimony from one of the party guests, Zay Prevon, that uh, Virginia told her, Roscoe hurt me on her deathbed. The judge decided that Arbuckle could be charged with first degree murder. Brady had originally planned to seek the death penalty. The charge was later reduced to manslaughter. So we're going into the first trial. We're at September 17th, 1921. He was arrested and arraigned for manslaughter. It, uh, the trial began November 14th. Uh, his defense counsel was Gavin McNabb. And uh, their first witness, or the principal witness was Pravon. That was, uh, what was the first name again? Zay. Zay Pravon, that's an interesting name. <laughs> I've never heard it before. Um, now, he, uh, Roscoe told his wife, Minta, that he, that he didn't want to harm Virginia. She believed him and appeared regularly in the courtroom. You know, she wanted to support him. But because of the public being the way they were, she was shot at 
while entering the courthouse and she never came back. Again, people never change. <laughs> it's gotten worse now. Oh my gosh. So, so uh, Brady's witness, Brady's first witness was uh, a model named Betty Campbell who attended the party. She said she saw Arbuckle with a smile on his face. There was uh, Grace Holtzen. I hope I'm saying that right. She was a nurse who said that it was very likely that Arbuckle hurt her, uh, you know, sexually assaulted and bruised her body in the process. Dr. Edward Heinrich, a criminologist, claimed that the fingerprints on the door to the hallway proved that Virginia had tried to flee, but Arbuckle had stopped her by putting his hand all over hers. You know, again, if the doctor has already said that she wasn't it's like that age-old thing if you say it enough people are going to believe it well you already got hearst running around constantly repeating it i guess but you also have to realize that um that he's trying to fix this whole thing that the, the prosecuting attorney is trying to fix matthew brady it was that his name again matthew brady i swear i've heard that matthew brady i do know where i've heard that name before matthew brady is also i swear a photographer from the civil war i'm pretty sure that's right i'll check <laughs> i've been trying to think i'm like Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there was a, a famous uh, photographer from that did all the photographs from the Civil War, you know, of the soldiers and of the battlefield and everything. And I'm pretty sure it's Matthew. I know the last name is Brady, and I'm pretty sure his first name is Matthew. So, sorry. Okay, <laughs> back on track here. <laughs> but like I was saying, the prosecuting attorney is trying to fix everything to just destroy he wants it to go his way so and and some of this sounds incredibly scripted and and sounds more like something i would see on perry mason <laughs> i love perry mason i'm sorry the 1960s version anyway. I know some of you are uh, fans of like the new version. Give me the classic any day, I love it. <laughs> and, uh, but, and I've read the books too. If you've never read the books, I actually heard someone say that uh, the author has no clue of the legal system. Earl Stanley Gardner was a lawyer. <laughs> Just, putting it out there but anyway I mean fingerprints on the door to the hallway proved that she tried to flee how would you know that <laughs> and uh you know and and and, had, and stopped her by putting his hand over hers you can't decide that because of a couple of fingerprints yeah it's just they were really stretching with this bullshit. I'm just putting, oh, good Lord. Um, so, and in cross-examination, Gavin, the defense attorney, uh, was able to get Campbell 
to uh, Betty Campbell to say that uh, Brady had threatened to have uh, my my eyes did a thing. Let's see. Campbell revealed that Brady had threatened to change to charge her with perjury if she did not testify against Arbuckle. You're busted, dude. <laughs> Dr. Heinrich Heinrich's claim to have found fingerprints was cast in doubt after uh, the defense attorney produced a maid from the St. Francis Hotel who testified she had thoroughly cleaned the room before the investigation took place. Now, I know that there, there might be some people who will um, attack that. They're like, oh my gosh, they didn't secure it? Well, no, they, they didn't secure it. You know, this is before, uh, you know, securing a crime scene. And uh, in fact, they didn't even know that it was a crime scene. They, she went home, remember? They, she wasn't hospitalized until two days later. They thought that she was just intoxicated. And um, until Dumont just opened her big fat mouth. And um, in fact, what was that? Uh, Lizzie Borden. They didn't secure that. I mean, the, the picture that we have, it seems like they, they dressed it up, didn't they? It, it, I mean, that's terrible wording. But um, that's not how the scene originally looked. That's how I should state it. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I don't know when they started uh, securing the crime scene. and But even with that, this was not a crime uh, because of the fact that they just considered that she was just sick from intoxication. And uh, then there was uh, the, the nurse, no, this is a different name. <laughs> uh, she admitted that Virginia never mentioned being assaulted while he treated her. Okay, and then Nurse Holston admitted that the rupture of uh, Virginia's bladder could very well have been the result of cancer and that the bruises on her body could also have been the result of the heavy jewelry she was wearing that ev evening. How heavy could that jewelry have been? I've never heard of jewelry causing bruises. You can educate, I don't wear a lot of jewelry, so I, I wouldn't know, but <laughs> I, I really don't. So, um, but I have never heard of uh, jewelry causing bruises. Like the closest thing I can think is, is like earrings. If you, uh, you, you know, you're trying to uh, uh, put the stud in and you, yeah, and you miss. <laughs> and, uh, but, yeah, and, and the, the result of cancer, that's logical. <sighs> See, he's asking the right question. <laughs> <laughs> but oh my gosh, everybody is so angry. It's just, I don't get it. I mean, I do. I, I get it. So, now Arbuckle went on the stand. He was the final witness. Um, it says that he was simple, direct, and unflustered, both with direct and cross-examination. He claimed that Virginia, oh, it says that he, he had known for 
five or six years. Oh, I thought he didn't know her. Uh, <laughs> again, <laughs> I don't know everything, but that's just one more of those uh, theories and whatever, because I've seen both where he knew her or he kind of knew her, didn't know her at all. Yeah, so uh, trying to weed out the facts here. <laughs> And uh, he saw her earlier that day. Uh, then um, Oh wow, daughter-in-law of Billy Sunday was there. <laughs> Billy Sunday is like an, an odd duck. He used to be a baseball player, and then he became <laughs> he became a pastor so that he could marry this particular uh, woman because her dad said that baseball players were immoral and he was not going to let his daughter marry a baseball player. So Billy Sunday ended his baseball career so that he could marry this girl. And apparently it was worth it. <laughs> but he was such a, he was, he, well, this isn't about Billy Sunday. I'll, I'll have to talk about Billy Sunday sometime. Because he's not your usual uh, preacher. <laughs> he's, oh. <laughs> so, I was right. Okay, so he discovered Virginia in the bathroom being very sick. <laughs> and then Virginia told him she felt very ill and wanted to lie down. So he carried her into the bedroom and, and laid her down and asked a few of the party guests to help treat her. I wasn't wrong. <laughs> this is coming from Roscoe. This is what he testified. Uh, when he and a few of the guests re-entered the room. They found her on the floor near the bed, tearing at her clothing and going into violent convulsions. And it had to be because of the pain. Um, to calm her down, they placed her in a bathtub of cool water. So the guests did that. And then Arbuckle and a friend then took her to another room and called the hotel manager and doctor. And that's when they decided that she was just very drunk and she would sleep it off. So that was his testimony. I, I, okay. So I'm not crazy. <laughs> There, there was a whole thing about being in the bathroom. He testified to it. Okay, so prosecution was presenting all kinds of medical descriptions of, because again, you have to understand that this was before having like, uh, <laughs> being able to do PowerPoints and all that. <laughs> It's so funny to, to think of all that now, you know, because we're so used to it. And then you think of, well, they didn't have that. <laughs> so he would present descriptions of her bladder as evidence and uh, as evidence that she had an illness. Okay. Um, why would, uh, yeah, an Arbuckle denied that he had any knowledge of Rap's illness. Why would he, he know that? I, I got to tell you something. There are people that have known me for years, as far back as high school, and they still don't know that I have epilepsy because we've kind of lost touch and, and everything. I mean, this guy is bonkers, I swear. I, you know, it's like they're so desperate to prove a point, you know, try and make this person look ridiculous. But at the same time, they're the ones that look like idiots. <laughs> Um, 
So there's, uh, during cross-examination, uh, Arbuckle was grilled over the fact that he refused to call a doctor when he found Virginia sick and argued that he refused to do so because he knew of Rapp's illness and saw a perfect opportunity to to sexually assault and kill her. Okay, dude. <laughs> yeah, he, he never, he just, he continued to say that he didn't do that. He also said, why would you do that with a bunch of guests there? I just thought of that. Why would he put his career on the line? I mean, like, because you think about all of, I mean, he's like at the top. You know, you have a guy that he's a writer for movies. He's a director, a producer. He's He's got, I don't remember if Comic was still, I don't know if it crumbled at that point, but and I mean, he's doing really well. Why would he throw that all away? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I, ju I just thought of that following this thing for years and it's like why i mean th this is like the ultimate question he's got a hotel filled with party guests and like <laughs> why? why would he um take that risk yeah, that's, I'm getting so irritated right now. And I know this, this, these events, I'm <laughs> oh, good Lord. Okay, so testimony lasted two weeks and, and everything. I mean, we're at December 4th, 1921, the jury, um, returned five days later they were deadlocked after nearly 44 hours of deliberation and a mistrial was declared there was a woman named helen hubbard who had told jurors that she would vote guilty until hell freezes over she refused to look at the exhibits or read the trial transcripts Having made up her mind in the courtroom, she, Hubbard's husband was a lawyer who did business with the DA's, oh, so it was so tainted, oh my gosh. Because of course, <laughs> and expressed surprise that she was not challenged when selected for the jury pool. While much attention was paid to Hubbard after the trial, some former jury members told reports that they believed that Arbuckle was indeed guilty but not beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay. Uh, some jurors joined Hubbard in voting to convict, but they all recanted except for uh, Thomas Kilkenny. That's an interesting name. Uh, a researcher, an Arbuckle researcher by the name of Joan Myers describes the political climate and the media attention to the presence of women on juries, which had only been legal for four years at that time. Yeah, I gotta tell you something. Researching for this book, because the chapter that I'm working on right now is a court scene. And I had to do extensive research on how a court works in the Edwardian era, um, because I I wanted to know, I mean, especially with knowing that there were women on a jury 
for this, I, I wanted to know if there were women when that was, you know, and so researching for that, it's, it's crazy how much the court system has changed just in 100 years. I mean, it's, it, it's crazy, man. So, so I mean, basically what this is saying is that the, the one woman, I mean, basically the media and, and the politics and, and all of that. And there were also women who just, they just decided that he's guilty. They were all affected by it. And I have to wonder, did they even see her movies? Or it was just one of those things to be mad about. That's the thing that gets me. It's like people just latch onto something, not knowing. <laughs> I, <laughs> it It's just, it doesn't affect them in any way. It has nothing to do with anything that you believe in. It's like, okay, this woman died. And because you're a woman, you're going to be pissed off about it. <laughs> That makes absolutely no sense. Oh my gosh. Okay, so we're moving into the second trial. Again, I know that this video is long. <laughs> Imagine how it felt for Roscoe having to deal with all this hell. So January 11th, 1922. So technically a hundred years ago, as of last month. So with a brand new jury with same legal and prosecution as well. Oh, so we still got the same, still got Matthew Brady. Okay, so um, same evidence was presented but this time, one of the witnesses, Zay Prevan, testified that Brady had forced her to lie. Oh, you're so busted. <laughs> See, like I said, he wanted Roscoe gone. And I mean, the whole thing snowballed so fast because of Dumont. Like, I, and, and nobody checked they just made all these theories like the police just decided oh yeah this is why her <laughs> we're talking about somebody who was very sick who died and you're turning it into a freak show this is absolutely unacceptable i mean it's just I mean, yes, you want to know the truth, but quite honestly, the truth was she, she was never sexually assaulted. She never was pregnant. She never, good Lord. Yeah, and then we have a security guard saying that Arbuckle had once shown up at the studio and offered him a cash bribe in exchange for the key to Virginia's dressing room to, so that he could play a joke on the actress. And he refused to give Roscoe the key. Turns out that the security guard was an ex-convict who, oh. who was charged with hurting an eight-year-old girl. And it turns out Brady was willing to reduce the sentence if he testified. Brady is scum. Oh, man. 
I didn't realize that that security guard was that. I mean, I I heard that he was a um, uh, a convict, but not to that extent. That's a new one. <sighs> yeah, uh, Brady hired a lot of uh, convicts and criminals and all of that, and just... but thankfully Roscoe's uh, legal team weeded him out, just like this one. Um. Well, in, in the first trial, wraps Virginia's history of promiscuity and heavy drinking was detailed. In this one, in the second trial, also discredited some major events, such as the identification of Arbuckle's fingerprints on the hotel bedroom door. Heinrich took back his earlier testimony from the first trial and testified that the fingerprint evidence was likely faked. No kidding. It sounded fake. <laughs> it, <laughs> I mean, even just reading it here, it, it, it sounded like something that was scripted. I, I, I even, <laughs> you're a little late to the party on that one, dude. <laughs> I just want to point out that it's, <laughs> um, So Arbuckle didn't testify in this trial. Um, and some of the jurors interpreted the refusal to let Arbuckle testify as a sign of guilt. Oh man, they can't catch a break, can they? Uh, they were deadlocked resulting in another mistrial. So we're going into a third trial. And by this time, his films had been banned. Newspapers had been fill, filled for the past seven months with stories of Hollywood orgies, <laughs> murder, and sexual perversion. OK. <laughs> See, this is. This is why sometimes I really uh, despise the media because they take something like this. This is somebody's life on the line and you just are running crazy with it, thinking that it's funny. You're getting your however much money you want with it. Somebody has died and you really could care less. Well, guess what? Uh, Delmont was touring the country giving one woman shows as the woman who signed the murder charge against Arbuckle and lecturing on the evils of Hollywood. Well, the funny thing about that, <laughs> the judge caught up to her, found out that she was a criminal. Yeah, she, she uh, had a rap sheet. And then suddenly she disappeared without a trace. And uh, because he had, <laughs> he told her to come back, told her that she couldn't make a buck off of this trial. And then when she found out that the police were coming after her, she disappeared. Now, I've tried to look everywhere if they actually ever found her. <laughs> as far as I know, she changed her name and everything, hoping that that would. So it could be that under a different name, she was caught and was thrown in jail. I'll never know because I don't know if. <laughs> but oh, my gosh, she was the parasite of this. She's the one that started everything. She just out of the blue said, and I've also heard where there were people that said 
we don't know who this person, you know, the, the best friends of Virginia who said, we don't know who this Delmont is, but she's uh, saying that she's best friends with Virginia. So, so she inserted her, so I hate people who do that. <laughs> Lecturing on the evils of Hollywood, I think, is like, <laughs> she's the one that started it. <laughs> she's the one. Uh, she's the evil in this case. Oh. <laughs> I love a hypocrite. <laughs> so um, there's that. <laughs> yeah, she got it in the ass so hard, and I love it. I love it when karma hits. <laughs> so anyway, so we have this third trial. It's March 13th, 1922. So in March, it will be 100 years for this third trial. And this time his defense team is just taking off the gloves. They're, they're done. I mean, and I, as far as I know, Matthew Brady isn't in this one, um, but I could be wrong because it seems like the, the judge was just so done with his antics. You know, he, the judge put up with it, the first two cases, you know, the, the first two trials and that last trial, especially after finding out about that security guard. <laughs> that that was the end for yeah and it seems like he was investigated after that and i think he was on suspension for that it was like i understand that you are trying to do a job here but you need to bring the facts to the case not intimidate all of these witnesses and and just yeah mm. So yeah, it seems like there's a different prosecutor, but I don't remember what the name was. It might say here, so we'll see. Um, yeah, so McNabb took an aggressive defense and he just, he was just, he destroyed the prosecution's case. Uh, I mean, he felt like, I read somewhere that he felt like he, just he felt like if he was too aggressive in the first two that that would hurt roscoe in some way and um because people were so because of how the public was and he says i just don't care at this point my job is to defend roscoe arbuckle so and and he just he just had it with how things were going in this case. He was tired of the of the criminals being brought in as fake witnesses and and all that. And so yeah, he, he was done. And um so he was able to uh bring in more evidence about Virginia's past and medical history. Uh and then uh, there was a, he, he continued to just destroy uh, the case with uh, Pravon. If you remember Pravon, Pravon, I think stepped out of the last one. I'll have to say. Uh, he was a key witness, was out of the country after fleeing in police custody and unable to testify. Um, so Arbuckle testified again and maintained his denials and everything. Uh, Buster Keaton is said to have been in the courtroom and provided important evidence to prove Arbuckle's innocence. Delmont was involved in prostitution, extortion, extortion and blackmail. So and that's what Buster Keaton brought in. <laughs> um, and that's one of the reasons why the judge went after her during her little 
tour. <laughs> uh, McNabb, uh, during closing statements, McNabb reviewed how flawed the case was against Arbuckle from the very start, how Brady fell for the outlandish charges of Delmont, whom McNabb described as the complaining witness who never witnessed. Thank goodness someone said it, and they said it then. <laughs> Truer words have never been spoken. Oh, good Lord. Like I said, she was a. And like I said, Buster Keaton, you need a friend like that. I mean, for him to bring in all that stuff. Oh, good Lord. It's like, no, I, I, <laughs> I'm a good person. <laughs> Constantly changing her story. And then for him to just bring in, oh yeah, she's doing this and this and this as well. Blackmail. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's that's totally legit. <sighs> okay, so the jury began deliberations April 12th and took only six minutes to return a unanimous not guilty verdict. They wrote a formal statement of apology to Roscoe Arbuckle for putting him through the ordeal of a dramatic, let's see, putting him through a dramatic ordeal, a dramatic move in American justice. So this is what they said to him. Acquittal is not enough for Roscoe Arbuckle. We feel that a great injustice has been done him. We feel also that it was only our plain duty to give him this exoneration under the evidence for there was not the slightest proof adduced to connect him in any way with the commission of a crime. He was manly throughout the case and told a straightforward story on the witness stand, which we all believed. The happening at the hotel was an unfortunate affair for which Arbuckle, so the evidence shows, was in no way responsible. We wish him success and hope that the American people will take the judgment of 14 men and women who have sat listening for 31 days to evidence that Roscoe Arbuckle is entirely innocent and free from all blame. So uh, Roscoe actually kept that apology as a memento until the end of his life. Um, I mean, after this whole thing, you know, there were so many theories and, like I've said, ideas that circulated. Uh, like it says here, experts later concluded that Rapp's bladder might have ruptured as a result of an abortion she might have had a short time before the fatal party. That was one that I heard for years. You know, it's it's a lot like from the time I can remember, we always heard, we always knew, or the theory was, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which one to say here. The idea was, I think that's the right one, that King Tut might have been murdered. Well, then, like, I think it was 2015 where evidence showed he was just a very sick man and the whatever it was in the back of his head happened during embalming and there were other uh mummies that had the same thing so um yeah uh so it you know you 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 hear a theory like that for and, and it just becomes embedded and you just continue to believe it <laughs> her organs had been destroyed and it was now impossible to test for pregnancy well i'm no medical expert so i i wouldn't know about that but i i i it, 
is that possible? That your organs can, that for that to, I don't know. Like I said, I'm not a medical expert, but that just seems, huh. <laughs> Yeah, but like I said, that was the story that I had heard for years. Now, he um, he did have to plead uh, guilty because of the alcohol that was there. So he violated the Volstead Act and had to pay a fine. But he owed so much money, like, a, let's see, $70,000, $700,000, which is... Let's see, ten million eight hundred dollars to uh, in our money in current money. That's so much money, <laughs> and that's in legal fees to his attorneys for the three trials. He had to sell his house and cars to pay some of the debt, so he was broke because he wasn't doing movies anymore. They weren't gonna let him do, I mean, he, 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 was, he was done. I mean, th this trial, destroyed his reputation. And, and his popularity. I mean, he was so popular when he, before this, everybody knew Roscoe Arbuckle. They, they would go to his movies, they loved his movies and, and everything. And he was, they enjoyed seeing Roscoe. And unfortunately, his reputation was never restored. He was a broken man. Um, and I think what really irks me is this gentleman, William H. Hayes, uh, was the head of Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America. Just banned him from ever working in U.S. movies again. And, and he made sure that he couldn't get any, it also says that uh, Arbuckle couldn't, that, that Arbuckle Films could not run anywhere, nothing. So he, he couldn't even get money that way. It just... And then, I mean, like the, the damage was already done that, you know, doing that. And then Hayes was like, oh yeah, I'll lift the ban. And it's like, Dude, you already destroyed this man. He can't get work now. <laughs> you asshole. Um, uh, so yeah, th there were a lot of films. I mean, people were so outraged that there were a lot of films that were destroyed simply because of this. Because of that bitch, Delmont. I blame her. I absolutely blame her. I mean, who, who else is there to blame? I mean, you, you think about it, this is the 20s, people are partying all right and left and this, that, and the other. And uh, who else? is there. It, now, his, his marriage didn't last. 
and uh, which Minta continued to say nice things about him. And, uh, and they continued to be friends afterwards. He did remarry after the uh, scandal and everything, a woman by the name of Doris Dean. He, he constantly tried to get back in. Acting was all he knew. Performing, acting, uh, since he was a little boy. And uh, he ended up abusing alcohol and uh, Buster tried to help his friend, uh, giving him work in, in films and everything. Like I said, Buster didn't care. <laughs> Buster did not care. And um, you know, and uh, such as uh, Arbuckle apparently co-directed some scenes in Sherlock Jr., which I, I want to critique. <laughs> and because um, I, I like anything having to do with Sherlock. <laughs> and um, but it, it says here, it's unclear how much of this footage remained in the film's final cut. Now, I know that this particular film is on like DVD Blu-ray, so possible that they were able to find, you never know. I mean, you could tell me, <laughs> it, it's wishful thinking at least. Um, There was also, uh, he appeared alongside Buster, Harold Lloyd, Valentino, Douglas Fairbanks, and Jackie Coogan in a film called Character, Studi Character Studies. And uh, in Photoplay's August issue, he wrote uh, uh, James R. Quirk, That sounds like a journalist name, doesn't it? <laughs> four, four movie stars. <laughs> I would like to see Roscoe Arbu Arbuckle make a comeback to the screen. Um, so it wasn't like people had completely abandoned him. It, it just, I don't, I don't know what it was. No, I, I know, I know what it was. You got people like William Randolph Hearst, <laughs> who made such a mess of things. You also got someone like Delmont, who makes a mess of things, who says things like, you know, the evils of Hollywood. Well, you were the one who did it bitch. Now, he worked as a director for a while um, under the name, it was a pseudonym, uh, William Goodrich. And uh, his father's full name, if you remember, I said William Arbuckle, his full name was William Goodrich Arbuckle. Um, so he used his dad's name. <laughs> and uh, now Buster Keaton suggested that he use William B. Good and Arbuckle said no the, the pun was too obvious and uh so
Then in uh, 1924 and 19, between 1924 and 1932, uh, Roscoe directed a number of comedy shorts under the pseudonym for, under that pseudonym for educational pictures, which featured lesser known comics of the day. Louise Brooks, who played the ingenuine I don't know what that word is. In Wendy Riles, Wendy Riles, I'm not using words now. <laughs> We're getting close to the end, kids, I promise. Wendy Riley goes Hollywood, uh, told Brownlow of her experience in working with Arbuckle. Uh, he made no attempt to direct this picture. He just sat in his director's chair like a dead man. He had been very nice and sweetly dead ever since the scandal that ruined his career. But it was such an amazing thing for me to come in to make this broken down picture and find my director with the great Roscoe Arbuckle. Oh, I thought he was, a, he was magnificent in films. He was a wonderful dancer, a wonderful ballroom dancer in his heyday. It was like floating in the arms of a huge donut, really delightful. So that basically gives you an idea of what this uh, scandal did to him. He just sat in his director's chair like a dead man and because uh, uh, Wendy Riley goes Hollywood is 1931, that's 10 years after it happened. And it's just, and, and he'd been trying so hard to get back into, and he had to change his name just to get back in. And it's like, he's just a zombie. It's just, it's just sad. Very, very sad. Aside from trying to get back into film, uh, Roscoe and Dan Combs, who was a mayor, looks like, reopened the Plantation Club near one of the studios, uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayor Studios. And uh, as Roscoe Arbuckle's Plantation Cafe in 1928. He sold his interest in 1930, and it became known as George Olson's Plantation Cafe. I'm not sure if it's still there. <laughs> it doesn't say. So, Pretty much. I mean, he he didn't do any, well, I think he did two sound films, if I remember correctly. And, uh, or he was, let's see, on June 28, 1933, he had finished filming the last two reelers. The next day he signed a contract with Warner Brothers to star in a feature length film. The night he went out with friends to celebrate and the new Warner Brothers contract when he reportedly said, this is the best day of my life. He then suffered a heart attack later that night and died in his sleep. And um, so um, yeah, I don't think he he's been he was in any talkies. But I will double check on that. So pretty much in closing, because I know this video is really long, but 
three trials, okay? Three, <laughs> three trials, trying to get everything together. Um, this was a, a gentleman who became very successful in Hollywood. And we also can't forget that Virginia Rapp was becoming an aspiring actress. I mean, um, her career was cut very short and uh, she was a model and um, and then, I mean, she 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 worked with Rudolph Valentino, <laughs> but the main thing here is that for years there's always been two sides. You know, people will side with Roscoe and then like demonize Virginia, or they'll take Virginia's side, demonize Roscoe, and at the end of the day. She was, unfortunately, she was, she was a very sick young lady. And um, it, it was the 1920s and Roscoe had this party and he was just trying to help her. Now, I said it earlier that, you know, nobody's gonna know except for the two people that were in that room. But um, the way that the media just took off as quickly as it did, I mean, people immediately decided that Delmont was right. And it's like, I have read in several different books and everything where there were people who were friends with Virginia and there were people who were at the party who we're saying, I don't remember ever seeing Delmont there. I don't, who, who is this woman? She, <laughs> I don't remember ever seeing her around Virginia. So, um, it, it's, it's a very unfortunate thing, but people never change <laughs> because, Something like this happens and they never listen to the facts. They never wait for the facts or they get the facts and they still go for the, the person that's squawking. <laughs> well, look at how much of a mess this, that made for this. It ruined a man's career and it ruined the man. And also, Poor Virginia, she, she was completely forgotten. People were just angry. How many of those people who were so angry shooting at Roscoe's wife when she tried to support him? <sighs> Out of control. How many of them actually watched her films or even knew that she was in these movies? Yeah, <laughs> that's the part that bothers me. So, if there's anything in this video that is incorrect, you can, of course, correct me. <laughs> I love hearing from you. I won't get hurt <laughs> if you correct any information that I have put in this video. But um, this is an event that I have followed since I was in high school, about as much as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. It interests me a lot, and I would love to hear what you have to say about it.